Fora TV. The world is thinking. Stuart Schulska here in Copenhagen with Bill McKibben at COP15. And Bill, thanks for taking a little bit of time for us today. Um, I'm going to start you off with a very broad but not necessarily easy question. There's been an awful lot that's gone on into this conference, a lot of anticipation, a lot of planning, a lot of hype. Are you happy with how it has proceeded so far? It is a broad question. So I'm happy with some things and unhappy with others. We're not moving towards a good deal that will save the climate uh, in the opposite direction, if anything. We just got the latest numbers from what all the deals, if you add them all together, look like. And it's a world where the temperature goes up four degrees centigrade. Uh, that's so far from what we both can and must do that it's ludicrous. So, so far it's been, in that sense, a disaster. The good part is that for the first time in the history of this process, there's strong movement building around the world. And we've seen evidence of that in our own work at 350.org, where in October we had the most widespread day of political action in the planet's history, 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries. And we've seen evidence of it here in this hall, where with that kind of backing behind them, delegates from small and poor nations have felt able to be much stronger in their demands, in their participation than they have in the past. They've got, in some sense, a little bit of an army behind them in people around the world trying to, trying to take this as seriously as it must be taken. Very good. Uh, talk a little bit, if you will, about 350.org. I understand that it was kind of an outgrowth of your, uh, the booklet that you wrote, Step mm, Up, yep. and it has kind of become your focus in recent days. Yes. Not? Well, I'm a writer by trade. 20 years ago, I wrote the first book about climate change for a general audience 20 years ago this fall. Um, but I've There's become a tie, by the way. Sorry yes, to interrupt, 350 is the most important number <laughs> in the world. Okay. We learned it two years ago after the summer of 2007 when we had rapid melt of Arctic ice. And since then, uh, as scientists have examined this question more closely, they've told us any value for carbon in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million is not compatible, as they put it in one paper, with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. Okay? That's pretty strong language. Stronger still when you know we're already past 350 at 390 parts per million and rising two parts per million per year. We're in a desperate emergency, and it requires political action on a much stronger scale than we've seen from this conference. The only way we're going to get it is if we keep building those kind of movements that can provide some real power. So just to clarify then, the 350 is the parts carbon that we need to, per person, that we need to bring. No, not per person. Parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay. So the atmosphere is composed at the moment of 390 parts per million CO2, and we need it to be 350 or less. Before the Industrial Revolution for all of human history, the atmosphere at about 275 parts per million CO2. Got it's it. been going steadily up, and now we're past the danger point. This is not a problem for your grandkids. This is a problem for you. What's uh, getting to some practical issues then, in terms of what people can do? You've written a lot on sustainable living. Uh, if you were to say, I don't want to just like arbitrarily say, say three things, but if you were to say a few things that the average, let's say, Westerner mm -hmm. uh, or American needs to do or be thinking seriously about sure. doing to transform the way they live? So let's answer that two ways. I mean, one is the way that you really want me to answer it, and I'll give you a little list. Uh, you should uh, uh, turn down your thermostat dramatically and insulate your house so that you're not wasting any fuel oil. You should figure out how to transport yourself uh, without a, a big private automobile and without a private automobile at all if you possibly can and you should uh, start eating most of your food grown very close to home those would be three useful things but even if we started doing those things one by one it wouldn't add up in time you can't solve this problem one light bulb at a time so really 
the three most important things are political organizing, political organizing, and political organizing. We need you to save some of your effort to get together with others through campaigns like 350.org to really intervene at the top as well as at the bottom of this problem. We desperately need these global agreements to make this stuff really work. Okay. Uh, you were the editor of a volume called American Earth. It's mm. a collection of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, environmental writings since Thoreau. Yep, the best American environmental writing since Thoreau. So, specifically, if you were to the uh, environmental layperson to make a recommendation of one thing out of that volume that they absolutely must read, oh, yes. what would it be and why? Anything, anything at all by Wendell Berry, okay. the great Kentucky farmer and essayist who I think is the greatest living writer in America right now, and a, uh, a, a person who understands more deeply than anybody else why the world that we could build is a lot nicer than the one we're inhabiting at the moment. That's good. Cutting back to COP15. Yes. How do you... From the sublime, yes. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Zigzagging here a bit. How do you evaluate the effectiveness of an event of this scale uh, with so much swirling around it? How do you come away from this It's pretty easy to evaluate. There's teams here from MIT and elsewhere who have good computer software that allows them to plug in the proposals that all the countries make push a button and tell you what temperature and what carbon concentration it yields. As of last night, if you take all the promises the U.S. and the EU and China and Japan and whatever have made for what they're going to do and stick them in that software and push the button, the number that comes out at the other end is in the year 2100, we'll have 770 parts per million CO2. We'll live in hell or a place with a remarkably similar temperature. Um, and that's the measure of what we're not doing here. So there is a clear statistical output by which you can measure whether or not this Unfortunately, there is. Would that this problem would yield to spin <laughs> and rhetoric, because uh -huh. we're going to hear a lot of it in the next few days, but that's not how physics works. These guys aren't negotiating with China and with the EU. They're negotiating with physics, and physics is a poor negotiator. It's stated its bottom line. If you want a world that works the way we're used to it working, 350 parts per million. Take it or leave it. I think I know what you're going to say to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is the science then settled? Carbon is the primary factor in climate change, climate variation. Yep. Uh, you know, that's, we've known that for 20 years and our understanding has gotten steadily stronger with each year that passes. Uh, and at this point, it's not even a matter of uh, you know, knowing it. All you have to do is look at the world. Watch the Arctic melt, watch glaciers dwindle, watch all the effects that scientists have said would happen, happen. Happen a little sooner than we thought because this is really, really going fast. Bill McKibben, thank you very much for your thank time. Thank you very much, Stuart. Real we pleasure. And we'll speak to you soon on some Good. occasion, maybe even this week, I hope. Thanks Fantastic. A lot. Stuart Schultz with 4TV in Copenhagen. Thanks a lot.